Today we'll be reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 17. Hear the Word of God. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? And so Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock. And water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men for us and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the sun set, and Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with a sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a reminder in a book and recite it in the, hearing, in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, a hand upon the banner of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Today we are continuing in our study of the book of Exodus. We started a couple of weeks ago in chapter 15, and um, we're going to go through chapter 20. And these chapters from 15 to 20 tell the story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt and then bringing them to Mount Sinai where they received the Ten Commandments. And so what we're studying is really that span of time um, in their story. It's, a, it's really about three months' worth of time that passes in that, in that period of, of time. And um, uh, what we have already discovered as we've been studying Exodus is that there is so much in Exodus for us. There is so much encouragement for us in, in, these, um, in these chapters and in this story. And, uh, and so let's go to God and ask Him to to help us again today. God, we, we come before you now uh, seeking the guiding and the teaching of your Holy Spirit so that your word would be uh, made known to us in a way that makes a difference in our lives. God, we know that you have called us together to be uh, one with each other and to experience your presence as only we can when we are gathered together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, uh, God, we come because we know that we need you, and we know that our lives are better when we study your word. And so again, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are seasons in our life when we can get so worn down that we can reach a place where we feel like just throwing in the towel. I mean, we can get so worn down and get so weary that we, we start thinking things that we really shouldn't think. We start entertaining ideas that are, are really not helpful to us, and it can lead us to a place of despair where we might say, you know what, forget it. And, um, and that's not a place that God wants for us to go. Um, I have to wonder if there's not some of that 
in what's happening with Moses here. But I was thinking about a, a season that I lived through. It was about 10 years ago, and I was serving in another church, and it was just a very busy time where there was there, there were just meetings after meetings after meetings, and, um, and I had to go to all these committee meetings, and then I had to meet with all these different people that wanted to talk to me, and we were going through some changes as a church, and I don't know if you've ever observed this or noticed it, but when churches go through change, the people can get a little antsy, and, um, and so there was all of that going on and swirling around, and, um, and, and I was starting, I was really burning the candle at both, in, about both ends, and I was getting to a place where I was starting to feel really weary. Well, one Sunday morning, I got up to preach, and, um, and, I, and I looked out, and there was um, about halfway back, um, about right next to the aisle, there was a man sitting there, and he had his arms crossed like this, and he had a facial expression, which in my mind, in the moment, I would made up a story, um, but he was actually my district superintendent, and uh, which, which, for those of you who don't know what that means, he was my boss. And um, normally they would call and say, hey, I'm going to come to your church this week, so you can kind of get prepared. But he just showed up. And with him sitting like this, with this look on his face, I was thinking, he hates what I'm saying. And, um, and I don't preach with notes, you know, I just, I just go with it. And, um, and so I, I, if, if I get distracted, it could be really bad. And so um, I've had to train myself not to get distracted by things, um, you know. So at some point before that had happened, I had already trained myself not to get distracted by crying babies because that happens, and I've learned, okay, just don't let that bother you. Um, I, I was getting close to not being bothered by people who were snoring um, or, um, or sleeping. I decided that, well, they're just resting in the arms of Jesus. Isn't that precious? Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and not to get distracted is so important for me, but, but he was distracting me. I have to tell you, he was distracting me. And I know that it had something to do with being so worn down and having worked so much. Um, but I got so distracted that I, I was forgetting where I was in my sermon, and I had these long pauses where I was trying to remember what was next. And uh, when, when worship was over and the day was over, I went home, and I went and I laid down on our bed, and I just lay there, and I was saying things to myself that are things that I would never say to somebody else. I was being so self-critical, and I was telling myself, you should really just go back to violin making. I mean, you, you, you really stink at this. And, you know, I was just all those kinds of things. And um, we can get to that place. When, when we get so worn down, um, we can get to a place in our minds that's not good for us, and it's not what God wants. It's not what He wants at all. Um, I wonder about Moses in this part of the story. He's been through a lot. He, he had murdered somebody when he was a young man, and he fled Egypt, and he, be, and he ended up marrying a woman, and he, and he had children, and he became a shepherd, but then God called him to go back to Egypt because they were crying out because they were under the burden of Pharaoh and they were oppressed. And God chose Moses to go and to lead the people out of Egypt. They were enslaved to Pharaoh. Um, so he goes, but then he has to do battle with Pharaoh and his people. And, um, and all throughout that, those battles where there would be a plague and then he would do the thing that made the plague go away over and over and over and he just watched as Pharaoh's heart became hardened but then finally finally Pharaoh allowed Moses to take the people of Israel and leave Egypt and so they finally left Egypt they crossed the Red Sea but as soon as they crossed the Red Sea as soon as they started journeying what did the people start doing they started grumbling and complaining there wasn't water to drink, and so he had to put some wood in the water and made it sweet, and they could drink. They ran out of food, we saw last week, and so Moses appealed to God, and God decided to rain down quail and manna so that they could eat. But then here we are at the beginning of chapter 17, and again, they're out of water, and they don't have anything to drink. They've made it to Rephidim, which was a place that they knew had a spring, but when they get there, apparently the spring was not flowing and so the people are angry, and they're frustrated, and they're thirsty, and, and, and Moses is getting to a point where he's just getting worn down. And so he does as he always does. He turns to God, which is the best thing that we can do when life gets difficult. 
and he turns to God, and, um, and he says in verse 4, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And then the Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. And so presumably, he does this, he hits the rock, and the water comes out, and the people are able to drink. But what's interesting is the way that Moses remembers this experience. Because the way he remembers it is not to remember it as that place where God performed a great miracle. That's not how he frames this in his memory. Instead, he names the place Masa and Meribah. Masa means test. Meribah means quarreling. And he names it these things because that's what he remembers the most, is how much the people were complaining, how they were quarreling, how they were testing him. And he's, he probably has attached to that memory a lot of frustration. Uh, he was so worn down by this point that he, uh, he has gotten to this place where he's even, it's even difficult for him to acknowledge the miracle. Well, then things get worse because Amalek comes and Amalek wants to do battle with the people and steal all of their stuff because that's what Amalek, Amalek was doing in those days. That was his way of surviving. He, would, he and his people, the Amal- Amalekites, would seek out people who looked vulnerable. They would attack and they would pillage and they would take everything and, and that's how they had stuff. Well, this is a quite a bit further south than Amalek was known to go, but it's probably because word was out that this really large group of people were traveling south along the Red Sea on the Sinai Peninsula, and they had a lot of stuff. I mean, they had so much stuff with them that they even brought their tambourines, as we learned in week one. And so they're, they're vulnerable. These are not people that were accustomed to fighting. These were not warriors that Moses led out of Egypt. These were regular people. These were brick makers. These were people that toiled under uh, Pharaoh's oppression. They were not warriors. And, um, and so Am- they know that Amalek is coming and they know what he's going to do. And just in case you're wondering who Amalek is, you can go back to Genesis 24 and you can read the, the genealogy there. And what you'll discover is that Amalek is the grandson of Esau. All of the people of Israel were the descendants of Jacob. Jacob and Esau were brothers, and they were at odds with each other because Jacob was a conniving guy, and he did some bad stuff. But Esau and Jacob, they, they broke apart from each other amicably somewhat, but they still hated each other. And so the descendants of Amalek and the descendants of Jacob are still at odds with each other. And so there's that behind all of this too. And so the, the Amalekites come. So picture yourself, you're Moses. You are so frustrated with what you're doing that you remember a place of a miracle as testing and quarreling, and you're worn down, and you've got this challenge that you're facing. You could imagine that, that Moses might be tempted to just throw in the towel. But instead, Moses does what Moses should do, and he... Um, he seeks the Lord's counsel. Uh, and so he says to Joshua in verse 9, Choose some men for us and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And now we're not exactly sure where he comes up with this idea, but I think it is safe to assume that he and God talked and that's what God told him to do. And so um, he decides that he would go to the top of a hill, he would bring Aaron and her with him, and that he would raise the, the staff. And as he raised the staff, it would signify that the one doing the battle is really not Joshua, but, it, but is God himself. And, um, and so that's what Moses does. And, so, uh, and, and Joshua does what Moses tells him to do. It says in verse 10, So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And then in verse 11, it says, Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed, but Moses' hands grew weary. I mean, you can understand that. If you try to raise your hand above your head for very long, pretty soon you get tired. 
And he was trying to keep that staff raised because as he raised it, they were victorious. As he dropped his hands, they were not victorious. And so he wanted to, but his hands were getting weary. He was getting worn down. And so the most beautiful thing happens next. The most wonderful thing that we see in this story happens right here. And that is that Aaron and her come alongside Moses and they hold his hands up. They have him sit on a rock, and you, ima- you can imagine him sitting, you know, kind of close to the ground. And you can imagine Aaron on one side like this holding up an elbow, and her on the other side holding up an elbow, so that while holding up his elbows, he could keep his hands raised and keep that, that staff raised so that they could be victorious. There are times when we get so worn down and so discouraged that we want to throw in the towel. And when that happens, it is so important to have somebody like Aaron, somebody like her, who will come alongside us and who will lift us up. And that's what we see happening with Moses. Moses has that encouraging presence of Aaron and her. And because they were there by his side, lifting his hands, they were victorious over the Amalekites. And, and that's a miracle in itself that they were victorious over Amalekites. But it would not have happened if these two had not come alongside Moses and lifted him up. And there are times in my life and times in your life when you will be so worn down and discouraged. And what you need are people who will come alongside and lift you up. When I was laying in my bed so dejected and doing all of that negative self-talk about the sermon that I had preached to the, the district superintendent who I thought was grumpy. Uh, I was so down. I was so discouraged. I, I really was thinking, I, I think I could still sharpen my tools and make violins again. But as I was laying there, um, into the bedroom walked our son Scott. And Scott is a very perceptive person. He was only 10 at this time. But he walked up to me and he, was, he knew something was wrong. And he said, what's going on? And I told him, you know, I preached this horrible sermon. It was the worst sermon I've ever preached. I really should not be a preacher anymore. I really should go back to be, being a violin maker. Or maybe we could, you know, maybe we could become influencers and have a van or something. And, <laughs> um, uh, and, and Scott, nor, you know, a lot of times I would have expected Scott to just say, Dad, it wasn't that bad, you know, just to try to encourage me. But instead, he got in on the bed with me, and he laid next to me, snuggled up. <laughs> I thought I was going to make it third time. <laughs> and uh, he goes, let's pull up the sermon and watch it together and see how bad it was. <clears throat> so, so we did, and, um, and so we watched it and got through it, and he said, it wasn't that bad. It was actually pretty good. And I I thought, well, yeah, I'd give it a B. And um, uh, I needed needed Aaron and her to come alongside me in that moment. And that's what Scott was for me. He lifted me up. He encouraged me. Wasn't the last time that he's done that. Um, This summer, as we would sit here and worship together, he'd put his hand on my shoulder and pray for me just sometimes we need that and um i know you need it and i know i need it sometimes i'm doing great by the way right now so i'm good (laughs) but we need those errands and those hers to come by come alongside and i've had so many in my life hannah has been that for me amy is that for me lots of you have been that for me Who have been the people in your life who have come alongside and lifted you up? I would encourage you to write down their names. Take some time this afternoon and write down their names and offer a word of thanks to God for them. And and think about when you get into that place where you're so in despair, call on the errands and the hers. Notice that, that Moses brought them with him. I have to wonder if he if he didn't know he needed them with him. Sometimes we need to ask the errands and the hers to encourage us.
but it is absolutely God's design and God's plan for us to have Aaron's and hers in our life that surround us and encourage us. That's what God wants for us. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 28, he said this beautiful thing where he talks about this. He said, and this is in verse 28 of Matthew 11. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus himself comes to us through brothers and sisters in Christ, and he offers us that encouragement when we need him. He wants us to come to him and allow him to help shoulder the burdens that we carry because this life is really hard, and he does not want us to get to that point of being so discouraged that we want to throw in the towel. And so he says, come to me, and he shows up in the errands and the hers that God has placed in our life. In, he, in Hebrews chapter 10, there's this picture of the church and how the church is supposed to be for one another. And, and the writer of Hebrews says in verse 24, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. It is God's desire that the church would surround one another with encouragement, to lift one another up so that we can keep going with what God has in front of us to be doing. So I pray that all of you would have errands and hers in your life that encourage you. But I also pray that you are an errand or a her to other people. Our being together is not an accident. God wants for us to live this life of following Christ, not by ourselves, but with each other. And so God is asking all of us to encourage one another as we go. My prayer for you is that you are able to experience that mutual encouragement that can make such a huge difference. Hallelujah for the errands and the hers that we have. Amen.